Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure to participate in this uh, conference honoring our late friend Michael Korczynski. Uh, I worked with uh, Mike for uh, several years at the old JNL Steel Company starting in 1973 uh, and uh, have worked, worked with him then for several years following that. Uh, today I want to uh, dedicate this paper to his memory uh, because it, it contains uh, information that was very near and dear to his heart. That is the, uh, the physical metallurgy of HSLA steels containing vanadium and nitrogen. I'd also like to thank my co-author uh, Dr. Waugh of uh, Bampery at Pitt for helping uh, with this uh, work and these slides. Thank you. This is the uh, photo of uh, Michael uh, back in, uh, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. in 1975 at the famous conference MA75. Uh, this is a bit of a, uh, a strange picture to me because when he would be lecturing me, he would always have his glasses off and in his hand. So this is a, a bit artificial to see him with his glasses on. And of course, we all remember this famous uh, photo, the cover of uh, the proceedings of MA75. What some of you may not know is the background is in fact Michael's suit jacket and the, and the, uh, the logo is the conference pin that w was distributed to the uh, attendees. Okay, uh, I want to start off with a discussion of the two main particles that we deal with in vanadium nitrogen bearing steels, especially those that are aluminum killed, and that is uh, vanadium nitride and aluminum nitride and their behavior in austenite. And these two compounds present a dilemma to the physical metallurgist because on the one hand, aluminum nitride, which has a hexagonal close packed structure, is more thermodynamically stable but vanadium nitride with a sodium chloride structure fits much better with austenite. And so therefore its precipitation can be uh, uh, much uh, easier. So on the one hand we have a more stable particle, on the other hand we have a better fitting particle. Some of this behavior is, was shown by Petitunia way back in 1965 with some very elegant work. I call your attention to the center slide and the, uh, the light blue curve, which is the nitrogen in solution. The center diagram uh, illustrates the behavior of a steel that contains both uh, uh, aluminum and nitrogen and nitrogen, uh, aluminum, nitrogen, and vanadium. And uh, the blue line depicts the uh, nitrogen that's dissolved in solution in the austenite as a function of temperature. And we can see that in order to get reasonably high amounts of nitrogen in solution in this steel, we have to resort to pretty high uh, slab reheating temperatures, uh, above 1200 C anyway. Dr. Petunia also in 1962 also um, studied the behavior uh, of precipitation of uh, VN and ALN uh, as a function of annealing temperature. And I call your attention to the center column top slide, the one hour slide. And what we can see is that the uh, uh, aluminum nitride precipitates first on cooling from right to left and the vanadium nitride precipitates at a little bit lower temperatures. We'll show that this is in fact correct and was found in our thermomechanical uh, processing studies that we'll discuss in a few slides in advance. This work was all summarized nicely in work by uh, Dr. Harry Stewart uh, at the JNL Research Center back in 1972 when he studied the effect of uh, the uh, reheating temperature, slab reheating temperature on the subsequent uh, behavior, transformation behavior of the VAN steels. The steel was shown up in the upper right. <clears throat> and what we can see here is it's not until we hit the <clears throat> vertical dashed green line that we start to see a, a, 
a discontinuous behavior. We start to see uh, much larger uh, increments in strength and so forth. And that, of course, is due to the fact that the nitrogen is being largely released into the austenite at the reheating temperature, and then and therefore able to be re-precipitated as Vn on the way down. You can see the same effect here on the right, where the uh, precipitation hardening increment is, uh, is plotted on the red line. Again, we see that uh, at around 2200F or so, uh, <clears throat> we see an upsweep in the precipitation uh, hardening. This type of behavior is again summarized in MA75 in the paper, uh, in the paper on the vanadium nitrogen steels by Dave Grozier of JNL Steel, showing the uh, underlying physical metallurgy of these high strength uh, HSLA steels. Uh, the blue line uh, is, of course, the whole patch relationship, uh, and, uh, uh, and then using the expanded form of the hull patch, we add to it the um, solid solution strengthening of silicon and manganese, followed by uh, some perlite strengthening, followed by some VN precipitation, shown on the top. Now, before we go much deeper into this, I think we have to review some uh, knowledge of microalloy. Uh, here is a plot of the supersaturation uh, of the microalloying species as a function of temperature for the different possible precipitates. And we see three basic types of behavior here. On the far left, we see the behavior of titanium nitride which builds up very large supersaturations, even at very high temperatures. Um, and of course, this helps uh, with the, uh, uh, the ability to refine grain size in the heat affected zone of welds. On the right side, we see the behavior of the vanadium compounds, and uh, they uh, build up their large supersaturations at lower temperatures. Um, uh, and. Uh, VC, of course, is not very uh, influential in controlling thermomechanical processing, as shown in the top of the slide, whereas VN and niobium carbide are, are both uh, uh, located uh, precisely in the right area to influence austenite recrystallization during rolling. We've known for some time that different microalloying elements uh, influence the recrystallization stop temperature of austenite in different ways. Here we see um, the uh, behavior of uh, vanadium, aluminum, and titanium having rather mild effects, where, whereas niobium has a very strong effect. But this, of course, this work by Cuddy at US Steel Research was done on low nitrogen steels. If, if this work had been repeated in high nitrogen steels, uh, that V curve would have been up closer to the niobium curve. The net result of this behavior, the strain-induced precipitation of Vn in austenite is shown on this slide, where we see the basic behavior of austenite during hot rolling, uh, and we see that uh, the, when the C curve of the uh, vanadium nitride precipitation, uh, located in red, has its effect, then we start to see uh, increases in the uh, recrystallization stop temperature. Now, let's review a few studies where people have compared uh, high nitrogen steels uh, with aluminum and with and without vanadium. Here is a, a study of uh, the reheating behavior of a series of microalloyed steels. These uh, all contain vanadium, and some contain titanium as well. And in the dialog box at the top, you can get an idea of the, uh, uh, the grain coarsening temperature. That's a temperature where we start to get uh, abnormal grain coarsening during slab reheating. Now, of course, the ideal uh, reheating temperature will be somewhat to the right of these bottom curves denoting the fact that uh, all of the microalloying is in solution and we have a uniform grain size, albeit maybe a little bit on the coarse side. 
In our laboratory, we studied this behavior quite some time ago, and we used this type of um, thermomechanical uh, simulation where we uh, uh, reheated the slabs, uh, embedded the thermocouples in the slabs, then we did a series of 50% hot reductions, followed by different holding times at temperature, followed by quenching or cooling. And what we saw was this type of behavior. The two top curves are the, um, uh, are the, uh, uh, the carbon steel and, um, uh, are the two carbon steels, and the two uh, bottom curves are the two vanadium steels. And right away we see a, a bit of a difference because of the, on the far left axis we see that the, the rolling, the presence of the vanadium uh, in the uh, rolled material led to pretty substantial grain refinement before anything really happened. And then following that we see that sim very similar behavior that at um, 1121C, both steels underwent some grain coarsening, whereas at 1038 steel, uh, the two steels were essentially uh, immune to coarsening. And if we summarize the overall behavior we would see here, uh, we'd see, we would see this, uh, the uh, carbon steel is on the left and the vanadium steel is on the right. And we see that at uh, 1038 in the carbon steel, we have slight grain coarsening, but no recrystallization. Uh, but recrystallization starts uh, at 950 and below, uh, whereas we have, uh, uh, for the uh, vanadium steel, we see the suppression of recrystallization uh, starting at uh, around um, somewhere between 870 and 954. Now this absence of grain coarsening in the V-steel 1038 was studied very carefully, and it was attributed to the precipitation of ALN in the V-steel at 1038. These uh, particles here are, in fact, aluminum nitride. When we lowered the rolling temperature, we, of course, uh, encountered uh, pancaked austenite, as would be expected. And when we looked into that in more detail, we saw this uh, very interesting array of of uh, vanadium nitride particles, vanadium carbon nitride particles, precipitated on the subgrain structure of the recovered austenite. This, of course, kept the austenite from undergoing full recovery and then recrystallization. So these particles were, in fact, responsible for the suppression of recrystallization at uh, 871. We're also very interested in the transformation behavior in vanadium aluminum nitrogen steels. And to, in that regard, we did a very detailed study where we um, uh, took a series of steels with three nitrogen levels and we subjected them to this thermomechanical processing. What we were trying to do is we were trying to study the behavior of the steels on the runout table following rolling and before coiling. This is obviously a strip simulation. And so you can see the deformation range that we were using. And when we looked at the, uh, the behaviors, uh, we saw this type of behavior, we saw this type of pattern. The bars represent the amount of ferrite observed. The steels show the nitrogen levels uh, presented in the upper right corner, and the coiling temperatures uh, are shown in the uh, box below them. So steel one with um, 52 ppm nitrogen uh, showed the behavior shown on the left, left hand bar, and the steel with the 211 ppm nitrogen showed the behavior on the right hand bar. And we can see that there is some difference here. And of course, we were very interested in what that difference was and what was responsible for it. So we used some of our advanced metallographic techniques to uh, define the different types of ferrite that we found. And what we were looking for here was, in fact, non-polygonal ferrite. Because non-polygonal ferrite uh, has extra strengthening uh, 
mechanisms involved and would be uh, stronger or harder than the polygonal ferrite formed at a higher temperature. And if we compare the, uh, the three steels uh, at very high coiling temperatures uh, on the far left, we see uh, uh, the, the uh, lower nitrogen steels showed a slightly more non-polygonal ferrite. But when we looked at the 550 steel on the right, uh, 550 coiled steel on the right, we see that the high nitrogen steel has uh, much more uh, non-polygonal ferrite. And we think that this is probably due, probably causing the increase in strength that people observe with lower coiling temperatures. It may not be due only to precipitation, but it may be due also to the fact that the nature of the ferrite is changing. Uh, and here is uh, uh, our attempt to uh, understand the nature of the strengthening. And you can see here the bottom contribution is the pyrrhos to barrel, and the next one is solid solution hardening, and the next one is dislocation hardening, and then the next to the top is the grain refinement, and uh, the precipitation hardening is the, uh, the box on the top. And we can see that uh, even in the high nitrogen steel uh, at uh, coiled at 650C, uh, that represents a, a, a rather small amount of uh, precipitation hardening. This, of course, can be explained by the um, TTT curve published way back in 1973 by Bat and Honeycomb at Cambridge, uh, where they were studying direct transformation of microalloyed austenite. And they showed that the nose of the uh, ferrite C curve is somewhere around 700 C. Um, and of course, there's interface precipitation uh, also present here, but not shown on this diagram. But, um, and so if we water spray cool uh, to 650 or 600 or 550, uh, chances are we're not going to see this type of polygonal ferrite that would contain the interphase precipitation. This type of precipitation is shown here. These straight lines are uh, demark where the uh, alpha and gamma transformation front was as the ferrite is forming and sweeping the vanadium and carbon and nitrogen in front of it and then depositing uh, sheets of uh, vanadium carbonitride. We looked a little deeper into this with the uh, field ion atom probe microscope and did some atom probe tomography uh, studies. And we found um, very fine VCN precipitates, normally uh, in the range of about four nanometers. Those are the, the red appearing particles on the right side of the slide. But also we found, uh, surprisingly, these vanadium uh, nitride complexes or couples or pairs that are shown by these red dots. And this, of course, is why vanadium-bearing high nitrogen steels do not strain age. It's because this nitrogen is not free to move because it's anchored by the vanadium and um, uh, therefore uh, it's, it's immobile and doesn't show strain aging. On the other hand, this also can contribute to the strength um, uh, over and above uh, the formal particles that form. One of Michael's uh, uh, real interests in this area was recrystallization control rolling. And uh, what he uh, proposed early on was to look at the vanadium titanium nitrogen system where the uh, titanium to nitrogen ratio was hypostoichiometric to minimize particle coarsening at high temperatures, and use the remaining nitrogen to form uh, VNC strengthening precipitates, uh, all of this allowing transformation to occur from recrystallized austenite. And so in, in a schematic form, we could look at it like this, that conventional hot rolling is shown by the upper uh, red line for multi-pass deformation, whereas recrystallization control rolling would be shown uh, by the bottom red line.
You can see the benefits of the, the grain refinement after several passes. And of course here what we're doing is we're balancing uh, the driving force for recrystallization versus the pinning force and we're balancing the uh, driving force for grain coarsening versus the pinning force. Because in RCR we want a rather small uh, uh, recrystallization uh, pinning force uh, but a rather large grain coarsening pinning force. And so that's illustrated in the block, uh, the, the rectangle on the lower right. So we want the pin, uh, the actual pinning force from the TIN to fall between uh, the uh, driving force for grain coarsening and the driving force for recrystallization. And of course, we used this in the early days, back in uh, the early 80s, we studied this very carefully. And here was a series of steels shown in the dialog box in the center of the slide. And uh, the uh, upper two curves are the grain coarsening temperatures for steels of various nitrogen contents. And the bottom two curves are the recrystallization stop temperatures. And so the region, region between the upper curves and the lower curves are, are, is in fact the operating window for RCR processing. And so you can see that we have a 200, 250 degree, degree centigrade operating window to uh, effect uh, RCR processing. Now, of course, we did this in some laboratory rolling studies. And this is shown here. On the left, uh, the, the vertical axis is the as-rolled austenite grain size. The x-axis is the uh, Zener-Hallman parameter describing the deformation. Uh, and on the far right is the SV of the austenite. And what's interesting is two things. Number one, the value of the SV is very high. 150 to 200 is a very good number. And, and number two, you see the, uh, the temperature insensitivity to this SV, which is uh, really important, an important uh, aspect in terms of uh, actual uh, rolling in a rolling mill. Furthermore, when we deformed, recrystallized, and held, we saw a very different post-deformation grain coarsening. Uh, here we see uh, uh, the uh, vanadium and the uh, vanadium nitrogen steel, steels on uh, uh, the upper two curves, and the, uh, the two titanium bearing steels on lower curves. Now what this is telling us is that we, get, we, we deform at 1050, we get re complete recrystallization, and that recrystallization will not coarsen uh, at holding times even up to 100 seconds at 1050C, which is uh, pretty phenomenal. There's one other advantage to uh, RCR processing, that is transforming from a recrystallized austenite. The resulting ferrite in low hardenability steels is much more uniform in size. As you can see, uh, you can see in the, uh, these uh, probability plots down here and summarized in the dialog box. Look at the uh, standard deviation uh, of the, the uh, vanadium titanium RC, nitrogen RCR steel as opposed to a conventional uh, niobium control rolled steel. So the grain sizes are uh, more uniform uh, in the RCR steel. Okay, I'd like to conclude with a few comments. Um, uh, MK was a pioneer in several areas uh, in this general field. One was, of course, the science and technology of the vanadium aluminum nitrogen steels. Number two was the uh, importance of the microstructure property relations in these steels. Number three was the thermomechanical processing of microalloyed steels. Four was optimizing the benefits of these steels for use in thin slab casting and rolling in the mini mills. And finally, five, the benefits of microalloy steels to sustainability are around the world to help, uh, uh, help uh, with the uh, sustainability of the steel industry. Thank you.